We're just a week away from the Super Bowl, or as it's known, a day of public mourning for the city of Atlanta, Georgia. So I don't know where you'll be next uh, Sunday, but wherever you are, whatever party you're at, whoever's house you're at, uh, there will be conversation about the New England Patriots, even though they're not in the Super Bowl this year. And thank you, Lord, for that gift. Oh, come on, if you feel it, let's just... Have a round of applause and a moment of celebration. Isn't that sad when you start cheering against other people, even more than for yourself? But everybody remembers it, 28 to 3, 28 to 3, halftime lead. Obviously, I've said it before, I'll say it again. Your pastor does the pregame chapel the night before. The favor of God comes on the team. They go out to a 28 to 3 lead. Sadly, they do not invite me in at halftime in the favor lifts. <laughs> Shelly and I are sitting amongst New England Patriots fans in the stadium, and during halftime, no exaggeration whatsoever, they are stunned and paralyzed. No one goes to the restroom, no one goes to get food, no one goes anywhere. They're just, you know, staring in shock into nowhere. And we are loving every minute of it. But at the end of the next half, we're sad. And literally, they are shedding tears of joy. They are hugging one another as if manna has come down from heaven because Tom Brady one more time has walked on water. Game-winning drive goes into the first Super Bowl overtime in which the Falcons meet defeat. And what they said about the Patriots, possibly the best comeback of all Super Bowls and maybe one of the best comebacks in the history of all sports, is that they came, Tom Brady brought them roaring back from the brink of defeat into victory. And I want to use that picture as a snapshot today for anybody in this gathering who says, I'm really loving this series, Roar, and I'm really loving the idea that we can have bold faith in a defining decade. But if truth be told, I think my best opportunity to roar is in the past, and I'm not convinced that I'm going to be a part of the roar of Jesus in the 20s to come. And I want you to know today that God brings people roaring back from the brink, and he puts them back in his story. Today is January. If, uh, if you didn't know, maybe you're listening to this message at a latter time, and uh, we always build our way up to Easter where we celebrate the resurrection, because I just say today that today is Easter at Passion City Church. There is no Sunday that we come together and sing these songs of praise that we don't come with a full understanding of the empty tomb. We don't come with the power of a risen Jesus. It's Easter every single day for the followers of Jesus. It's always a celebration of resurrection. So when we come to this text today, it's a text that most of us know. But it's the backdrop today for somebody that, as you are headed towards Passion City today, God was headed toward you. And the message was, I don't, I, I don't want you to feel like your opportunity to be a part of the roar is gone because Jesus does amazing, miraculous things, and he wants to do an amazing and miraculous thing in your life today. John's Gospel, chapter 11, the story that we all know so well, Jesus' friend Lazarus has died. Now, Jesus isn't overly perplexed by the situation. He tells his followers, actually, we're going to go to Bethany and I'm going to wake Lazarus up. That doesn't mean that he was asleep. He obviously, as we'll see in the text, was dead. But what Jesus was saying is, I got a wake up call for him that the story isn't over yet. And I wonder if that's maybe why you're at church today, because God has a wake up call in mind for you today. The story isn't over for you just yet. It says, beginning in verse 17, on his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. And so if you drop down to verse 38, he's interacted with Mary 
and Martha, the sisters of Lazarus and dear friends of his. So all of this, by the way, is a great setup for the questions we all ask. These were Jesus' friends, actually some of his closest friends, and the story still didn't go exactly the way they anticipated that it would go. And maybe your story isn't going the way you anticipated it would go, and maybe God isn't moving in your story in the way you anticipated that he would move. But that doesn't mean that God has thrown the towel in on your story. And it doesn't mean that you can't come roaring back. It says in verse 39 that Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. And he said, take away the stone. But Lord Martha, the sister of the dead man said, by this time, there's a bad odor for he's been there for days. And then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and he prayed, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice. There's the roar. It wasn't timid. It was bold. It wasn't meek and mild. It was confident. Jesus was convinced in what he was about to do. And so in a loud voice, Jesus calls, Lazarus, come out. Now, no one's sitting on pins and needles here today. Nobody's like, okay, what happened? What happened? Please tell us what happened. Maybe you're new to church and you're, you're sitting there like that, but most of us have heard this since we were little kids and we're like, yeah, we already know what happened. But can it not be lost on us today what happened? Jesus calls in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And next phrase, the dead man came out. People lost their minds. Nobody said when he got there, oh, this is going to be great. I've already read this. He's going to call his name and he's going to come out and we're going to unwrap him. We, we did a, a little bit of a pantomime of that at Vacation Bible School. I remember we put toilet paper all around little Eddie and then he came walking out and all the other kids went and took the toilet paper off of him and that's how they taught us the story. Nobody knew what was going to happen. So when he came out, this is pre The Walking Dead. This is pre all the zombie movies. Nobody's got a mindset for this yet. And when Lazarus comes out, people shriek and scream and lose their minds. And uh, they don't know what to think. Some are running. Some are terrified. Some are overjoyed. But everybody knows this is not normal. He comes out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And then Jesus said to them, further, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Can you imagine Bethany that night? Nobody went to bed in Bethany that night because there ain't no party like a resurrection party. <laughs> Can you imagine Mary and Martha back at, at, at parties are us? Hey, yeah, we, we, could, could, we got a receipt. Could we return the sackcloth and ashes? And they're like, what? I thought your brother died. He, he did. But well, why do you want to return the sackcloth and ashes? Because we need to get a whole thing of balloons and some of those noisemakers and some of those things you pull apart and they blow up because we're having a massive party at the house tonight because he was dead, but now he's alive. The, the story was over, but turns out it's not exactly over. Jesus showed up and Jesus changes stories. And I believe he wants to change your story today. He wants to change your mindset from a mindset of, man, I'd love to think I could roar in the 20s. I'd love to think I could be bold in the 20s, but it's all the collateral of the teens that's kind of got me thinking today that my best days are in the past. Now, I've never seen someone in the natural raised from the dead. I do believe it can happen. I've never seen that happen, but I've seen marriages that were completely on the rocks. I've sat with couples who've said, we say it's over. Forget about what everybody else says. I've seen people 
whose mental health was over. I've sat with people just like you have where relationships were done, where potential was finished, where dreams were completely dashed. I've been around people who were bound up with addiction and their mistakes and their failures and their past. I've been around people who have lost years, not we had a bad weekend, but we, we lost 2019, 18, 17, 16, and half of 2015, gone, just in the wind, down the tubes. And you have too. But I have seen people reach out with the tiniest bit of hope, and I have watched Jesus bring marriages that were in the tomb, sealed and decaying, back to life again. I have watched him turn stories around. Jesus is not intimidated by how bad your situation smells or how many days of decay have already gone by because he is a miracle worker and a restorer. And he doesn't want anyone to be left behind as he leads his church into the roaring 20s. He's not thinking all of us are going to go, but unfortunately, you're going to have to watch from the sideline because you're disqualified by what you've done or what's been done to you. And it's your choice today whether you want to step forward with the one who turns the stories around. I was thinking about Samson. What a great warrior. He had unbelievable strength and ability. He, he could do supernatural things. He was a judge of the people of Israel. Everybody knows Samson's story. He took the jawbone of a donkey and wiped out an entire Philistine army with it, among other exploits in God's name and for his glory. But eventually, Samson was caught in a compromise. And he revealed ultimately the power of his Nazarite vow his hair was cut, the anointing and the strength was gone. He was captured, his eyes were gouged out, and Samson, who was a great man for the glory of God, was strapped to a grinding mill for the enemies of the glory of God. But yet at the very end of his life, he was brought out to be sport and to be taunted by all the Philistine leaders, brought to the temple of their god Dagon, a place where an idol stood, and they just taunted God and Samson saying, this is God's man. This is God's chosen one. This is the one who used to show us the power of God. Now look that the power of our God, Dagon, has brought him into our house. And he now serves in this house. And Samson prayed one last prayer. He said, oh, sovereign God, can you come on me one last Time. And you know the story. Samson pushed on the pillars of the temple of Dagon, and the whole pillar came down to the glory of God. But what it says about Samson is what happened at the end of his life outpaced all the things that had happened in the beginning, in the middle of his life. That somehow it wasn't too late for once more God to show his power and his strength in Samson's life. And so are there consequences? Yes. And there were for Samson, but can God come through again for you? The answer 100% is that he can. The roaring twenties turned into the great depression from 1929 to 1941, but our nation came out of that even stronger. They call the people who came out of that time, the greatest generation. And maybe that could be your story today. Maybe you have not seen the end of your story, and maybe it's possible that it could still be said about you that you came out of the Dust Bowl and actually became a part of the greatest generation. God doesn't want to leave anyone behind. So yes, the 20s can be a repeat of the teens. We can just do that all over again. And some of us are teed up to do that already right now. You are a few weeks in to a brand new decade, but somehow you're still telling the same story of the decade you lived in in the past. And it's possible that that could be your future. You can repeat 
the story of defeat. Or maybe today is the day where things turn around and the 20s become the decade where you write a brand new story of God's resurrection in your life. The 20s could be about why you can't. Because Lord knows that's what 2018 and 2019 were about. And anybody that will listen, I'll convince them why I can't. But what if the 20s are a story about the fact that through the grace and power of God, you actually did? It's possible that God could turn your story around. It could be a decade that echoes what happened to you, or this could be the decade where you echo how God took what happened to you and turned it around for a story that shows his glory and shows his power. The Roaring Twenties could be a brand new storyline. Why? Because we're all hyped up about the talk today? No, because Jesus is still walking into graveyards and he's still calling people by name and he's still saying, move the stone and let them walk out and unwrap the grave clothes and set them free. It could be 10 more years about what you lack or it could be 10 years of you declaring how God has come through with his provision for your life. This is a pivotal moment in time. And if that's you today, a few things are going to need to happen. Number one, you're going to need to hear the lion of the tribe of Judah roar your name. I love how in this text it says, when Jesus approached the tomb, the stone has been moved away. He specifically says three words. Now, that's an economy even in and of itself on the scale of the miracle he's going to do. But the fact that he says, Lazarus, come out is important. Because if he had just walked up into the graveyard and said, come out, then all the dead people would have come out. (laughs) Now, if your name wasn't Lazarus, it was a little bit of a bummer for you that day. (laughs) But the point is that Jesus was doing something specific so that someone with no future heard his name. And if there's going to be a storyline for you of moving into the future, then somehow you're going to need to hear the lion of the tribe of Judah roaring your name. This is what happened to Jesus, and this is why I know it can happen to you and happen to me. What is Easter? Easter is the Father roaring the name of the Son. It wasn't the father saying, everyone who's died, come out of the tombs. It was him saying, that's my son. Come out, son. Jesus of Nazareth, come out of the darkness. Come out of the depths of the earth. And Jesus doing what Lazarus did, just on a far more massive scale of implication, coming out of the grave. Some of us are on this Winter Jam tour right now, Uh, Winter Jam being one of the greatest tours of the last couple of decades, led by the guys who are in a band called New Song. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of the band New Song, the Christian band New Song. They've been around since I started preaching. I think my first youth revival I ever did in Tifton, Georgia, New Song was playing. And I'm watching them side stage because they're in the night at Winter Jam, and it's still pretty phenomenal. These guys are, 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 are my age. Can you imagine uh, still doing stuff at that age? And they're, they're my age, and I'm watching them leading, and then they get to the moment where they sing the biggest song that they, they sing. Does anybody know this song? It's called... I almost heard someone say it. Everybody else says, I don't know what you're talking about. I just was born, and you know, 2008. (laughs) The song's called Arise, My Love. And oh my word, I hadn't heard it in a while. And I was like, man, this is like a classic. This this song's like 25 years old. You're thinking, it's a throwback moment, right? Wrong. This was a goosebumps moment. I lost my mind. I was like, yeah. When they hit the big moment, arise, my love, arise, my love. Death no longer has a hold on you. No more death sting. 
No more suffering. And this is where you have to go, arise, arise. And then there's one more up above that one, and you're just like, <laughs> thank you for coming to Winter Jam. This is the end of the evening. This is the moment. And standing in that moment, 25 years down the road from that song, I'm like, this is it. There was a moment in history, a moment on the timeline of the narrative of God where he said to his son, can you hear my voice, son? Because I'm roaring with authority. Come alive, son. And not only did Jesus come alive, it says in scripture about him that he became in that moment the firstborn from among the dead. That he would be the firstborn of many brothers and sisters who would follow in that wake. That when God called his name, in effect, he was calling the name of everyone who would believe in him. And yes, that's about our eternal destiny. Yes, that's about the eternal victory we have over sin and death and hell and the grave. But it also is the backdrop today that that's still the God we came to worship today. And he is still a God who is capable of calling your name. Lazarus, Amanda, he calls names. And I'm praying by the power of God's spirit today that you will hear him call your name. And you will know this isn't just a message today. This is my message today. It's my invitation today to step forward into the possibility and the power of God. The second thing that's got to happen today is that somebody here has got to yawn before you roar. God does want you in the story. He does want you to live a life of significance that Ben talked about last week. He does want you to find this spirit of boldness, and he does want you to be rooted and connected to a conviction that you can walk through life actually convinced that the power of God is real because it has been real in you. Yes, God wants you to be a part of the city hearing his name, of your neighborhood hearing his name. But for a lot of us, it's not just an instant step into, hey, I'm going to start roaring tomorrow. No, before you roar, you need to yawn. You're like, well, what in the world are you talking about? Yawning doesn't sound like something that the followers of Jesus need to be doing. No one's ever written a worship song about that. So come on, church, let's yawn a big yawn for Jesus. But maybe they should. Because the scripture says in Ephesians 5, down toward the end of this section where it's talking about the struggle that we all have with who we're going to be in this world, whether we're going to live like the world or different from the world, whether we're going to blend in or stand out, whether we're going to let our flesh take over and tell us what to do, or we're going to let the Holy Spirit take over and lead us into life. And this is what it says coming down to the end of this paragraph in verse 14. It says, for it is light that makes everything visible. And this is why it is said, wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Wake up from the dead, from the depths of a life that has been one failure after the other. Wake up from a life of doing it your own way and charting your own course. Wake up from a life that said um, there's been too many complications and too many defeats and too many difficulties for me to ever stand back up on my own two feet and do something for the glory of God. Wake up out of that kind of thinking. Let Christ shine light into your darkness, whatever it is today. And when he does, you're going to yawn a big wake up yawn. I'm coming too. We were in Africa a few days ago on a safari and we got to see some leopards, part of the big five, and we hadn't seen leopards before, so we were pretty fired up, and especially seeing them close enough where they could actually jump in the vehicle that we were in was pretty exciting. Um, and we came upon this one leopard uh, sleeping in a tree. And it looks like we shot this with a telephoto lens, but um, we really were close enough to where, well, I'll just get in proximity to where we were. Um, we, we were right here. And she was up there a little bit higher. And she was sound asleep when we got there. 
minding her own business early in the morning. She's pregnant and expecting uh, little leopard uh, babies. And so she should be sleeping. But vehicle pulls up under her and we all start going, oh my word, this is amazing. And she kind of wakes up and looks around and checks us out. Okay. Eventually kind of starts moving, decides, I'm going to wake up. And when she does, she yawns the biggest yawn you've ever seen. And we capture it. We post it. And somebody said, that is so amazing, especially in this series called Roar. I was like, oh man, wrong message. You would have thought we would have seen a lion had the Lord been on our side that day, but we didn't. We saw a leopard and they don't roar, they purr. So get ready for that starting on March 11th, a new series, purr. It's a shade of Mac lip gloss in case you were wondering. Sorry, babe. <laughs> and we could hear her purr. Oh, don't you worry. We, we, we didn't take that as a sign that we should pet her. She purred and then she got up and stretched and then she walked right down that tree and plopped down on the ground right next to us. Cathud. She walked behind our vehicle. So we turned around and followed her. She walked about from here to there and went up another tree where she had left the impala that she had killed the day before. She'd eaten most of it, but you could see it's, I'm sorry, I saw a look on someone's face. Yes, we're gonna go there just for a minute. Cover your ears. You could see it's four little legs hanging over the branch. She walks back to the branch and now the hyena who have been sleeping under the tree, they also wake up and I see a big yawn from a couple of them as well. The, the alpha female hyena gets directly under the impala. She gets that spot. Mrs. Leopard, who is now fully awake, proceeds to eat what's remaining. Do you want to know? The head was all that was left. And she is crunching it, and we are close enough that we can hear every crunch. You're like, this, is, this shouldn't happen. I'm calling somebody. We're starting a thing. No, this is how the world works out in the safari land. And I was like, what was a yawn was simply a wake up to who she is and the potential that she has. And somebody in this place today, you don't need to worry about roaring in your office tomorrow. You don't need to worry about roaring in your family. You don't need about roaring in your community or among the friends that you're hanging out with. You're not ready to roar yet, but you do need to yawn. You need to hear God call your name today, and you need to wake up out of the stupor with a big yawn that says, whoa, I am a daughter of God, a child of God, or I can be by faith in Christ. I have got a future in God. And there needs to be a giant yawn today that says, I'm waking up. The enemy has had me anesthetized to the purpose and plan of God. And I have believed the lie that my best days are in the past, but I'm waking up today and I might not roar today, but I am going to roar in the future. I might not be on my best game by today, but I will be back living the life as the person that God has created me to be. And then lastly, I just want to implore us as a church that the city is waiting to hear this message. I don't think we have a real conception today of how many people live in our condominium who think their best shot is over. I would dare say half the people in this city have crested over the hill of, I got it, 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 to I don't have it, I don't have it, I don't have it. 
And, it, and maybe the first half of the I'm up the hill crowd aren't really ready for our message yet. But I would dare say everybody in this building has been through the valley of the shadow of death, who has faced some kind of defeat, and who actually is in church today because you know you don't have it all by yourself. And if we understand and believe that this is the city, these are our friends, these are our coworkers, these are our neighbors, these are the people that we work out with, then we know we have a stewardship of a story and someone who can move stones and bring people back into their purpose and their plans for their lives. And we got to offer them something more than. I'm really sorry to hear that. The church in the roaring 20s has got to wake up and understand that if the city is going to hear the lion of the tribe of Judah roaring in cemeteries, it's going to hear the roar through us, through you, through me. And we've got to come to people and say, you know what? I, I see that there's been devastation here, but I just want you to know God hasn't thrown in the towel on your story yet, and I haven't thrown in the towel on your story yet. I am here to encourage you, speak over you, pray for you, walk with you, and hold you up to believe that God can still do something great through you. Do you believe that today? Yeah. See, a lot of you don't need the stone to be moved today. A lot of you don't really need this message today. Now, someone in the last gathering did. They, they were here in our gathering. I love this about church, ha having been released from incarceration for the last decade. How cool do you think it was on the timeline of their life that they showed up at church today and heard God calling their name saying, your chance to roar the greatness of God is not finished. But maybe that isn't kind of where you're sitting right now. And so it's not for you to say, I, I need to be set free and I, I, I need this message today. Maybe it's for you to say, I need to understand that I'm the carrier of this kind of hope today that I am the carrier of this kind of possibility and I'm not going to settle anymore for abdicating our position as co-roarers with Jesus to just say to my friends, I'm really sorry to hear that. Man, our marriage is on the rocks. It looks like he's gone. I don't think he's coming back. I am so sorry to hear that. Our, our son, our daughter, man, they have taken a left turn. We, we haven't talked to them in months and I don't know if they're ever gonna make it back. I am so sorry to hear that. Man, my friend there, uh, temporarily in an institution, things have really unraveled around the edges. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. Listen, this is not why God brought us out of the tomb so that we can walk through the streets of a city of zombies telling people, I'm so sorry to hear that. I'm so sorry to hear that. I'm so sorry to hear that. Our message is, I am so sorry to hear that. Could we just pause and ask the God of heaven who still does, does miracles to intervene in this story and in this situation? Because I don't believe he's thrown the towel in just yet. Now, yes, there are things that on this side of heaven maybe cannot be put back together again. And there are things possibly on this side of heaven, definitely on this side of heaven, that, that can't come out of the tomb. But can I say again today, you can come out of the tomb. Yeah. Louis, my marriage isn't coming back together, bro. I don't know what you're praying and what your prayer life is like, but um, he's already remarried like three years and has two other kids and they live in California, okay? There is not gonna be a, a reunion here, okay? Maybe the marriage won't come out of the tomb, but you can come out of the tomb. You can come up out of the tomb. You can get unwrapped from all the clothes and all the, all the constraints that have kept you all bound up, and you can come back to life by the power of God, and you can roar again the greatness and the glory of God, even though your story maybe is a story of defeat. You can still roar in the 20s, the greatness and the glory of God. That's the power of the grace of God. I've mentioned her story a lot, and I don't want to hold her up as a superhero because she's just an ordinary 17-year-old, actually an extraordinary, ordinary 17-year-old. But I've, I've talked about Nan 
in our gatherings a lot over the last six months, but if you don't know, Nan, high school senior, going into her high school senior year here in Atlanta, lost her father and her right leg just at the end of the summer in a jet ski collision. And they life flighted Nan to Grady from uh, quite a distance away from Atlanta. And they didn't know for a time if she would live. And there was a period of time where they thought she would lose uh, her other leg. But they were able to save her left leg and eventually woke her up from a coma to let her know that not only did she not have her right leg, but that her dad was gone. A week or so later, I'd never met Nan. I went with Grant Partrick to visit her at Grady. And I just remember walking into the building and, and kind of rehearsing in my mind, you know, what do you say? We, we, we've all been there. I'm so sorry you lost your father. I'm so sorry that you went through this. I'm so sorry about your leg. I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And of course I was sorry, but there has to be more then I'm so sorry. And God had given me a word for her. And I, I walked in and we met. I instantly could see there's something radiant about this girl. There's something resilient about her. She's a fighter. And I could tell that, but she was also broken. She just wept on my shoulder the very first time we met, sobbed. And then we would talk some more. She would sob some more. We would talk some more. And after a bit, I said, Nan, I just want you to look at this wall right here in your hospital room. And yes, there's a clock right here and a television sticking out all the little thing. And there's the whiteboard that tells you your nurse's name on this shift and what time they're going to come back. And there's this stuff and that stuff over here. But I want you to imagine that we came in with poster paper and we just papered this entire wall, floor to ceiling. And with letters that were four or five feet tall, we wrote on the wall the words, I can. And I want you to wake up every single day, Nan, and I want you to think about what you can do because the enemy is here already telling you what you can't do in life. But I just want you to know what you can do in life. You can do all things through Christ, Nan, who strengthens you. And when you wake up tomorrow, I'll tell you the number one thing you can do. You can worship God. You're like, well, why would you want to worship God? I'll tell you why. Because it's what we were created to do. It is our created purpose to give glory to the creator who made us. And even when you lose your dad and lose your leg, you do not lose your ability to worship the great and almighty God. Then you're going to be able to do the one thing you were created to do all the rest of your life. You may not be able to run as normally as you once did. And there will be a lot of real life consequences. But I said, Nan, I want you to know, even though they couldn't find your leg in the water after that accident, God knows right where it is. Your leg's in heaven right now. And when you get there, you're getting your leg back. Because the scripture says we are changed in an instant. And in that instant, you are going to leap and to run through the streets of heaven on your right leg and your left leg. You're getting your leg back and you're going to have it forever in the presence of Almighty God. And you can do a whole host of things. You can be a generation changer. You can be a mother. You can be a business owner. You can be a voice for God to your peers. You can be a game changer in history. You can be an entrepreneur. You can do whatever you want to do. You can take up a hobby. You can drive a car. You can go to prom. You can do whatever you set your mind to do. Yes, there are some things that will not be restored on this side of heaven, but you can, Nan. And I am sorry. And I told her that day, you've got a thousand miles to go but God is great and God turns stories around and he is going to turn your story around and he is going to use you in a powerful way in this generation. And I'll tell you, when we got to Mercedes-Benz Stadium for Passion and that flame had come all the way from Jerusalem, came through the portal of that stadium on the field, uh, came to the first group, Nick and Chris Kane, and they 
took that flame and lighted a new lamp and that walked down to Jay and Catherine Wolf and they took that, that, that flame and lighted a new flame and handed it to two other students. And those two students walked towards Shelly and me as we were gonna light that flame onto Sadie and Christian Robertson, now Sadie and Christian Huff's flame. And Sadie was gonna put it up on a stand to lead us into a new decade. And the two students that came walking towards Shelly and me in the middle of 65,000 people were these two students right here. And Nan insisted that she carry the light. Our friend from Mexico, he was like, I'll carry it. She said, oh no, I'll carry the light. You carry my crutch. Because she doesn't believe that her best opportunity to roar the fame of Jesus is in the past. That there is not too much water under the bridge for her to stand in hope and say, God, call me by name. And in some ways, dear friends, has awakened her like never before. And now she's got a story and you've got a story and I've got a story. Not to hide in a closet somewhere and forget in our past, but to say to the world, God brings people back. And I believe that while I am so sorry to hear that, that God hasn't thrown in the towel for you. That you can come roaring back from the brink. And he's saying that over you today. He's speaking that over you today. Oh, there's an enemy speaking exactly the opposite over you. But come on, it's time to unwind all of his lies. And you're going to need help once you step out into the light of Jesus to have people come around you and help take all that stuff off of you. But the end result is going to be the same as in this text. You're going to be free. And many people, the next verse it said in John 11, came to believe and put their faith in Jesus.